Hello and welcome to Gardening Australia. We're on fertile ground this week with an absolute bumper crop of stories that we can't wait to share with you. Here's what we've been working on. For all of us who love our pets and our plants, I have an important tip about plants we should try to avoid. Are you planning on overhauling your garden, maybe coming up with a new design or updating an existing one? Well, before you get stuck in, I want to show you how to do a simple site analysis to help you make the most of your space. I'm visiting a florist and social enterprise in inner city Melbourne who are growing skills and relationships for women from refugee backgrounds. And what they're doing is beautiful. And the way plants adapt to survive can be surprising. I'll be taking a look at one that normally goes unnoticed but is absolutely remarkable. What could be worse than biting into a fresh homegrown apple and finding a worm? Finding half a worm? Well, Hannah's here with all the tips to help protect your precious apple crop from codling moth. Losing your fruit to codling moth is a particular type of sadness. You pick a beautiful apple that you've watched grow and ripen for months, you take a bite and, well, it's devastatingly disgusting inside. Codling moth is an introduced pest that lives on and in fruit like apples, pears and quince. They're a major problem for commercial growers as well as home gardeners as their larvae eat the fruit from the inside out and can destroy whole crops. Unfortunately, there's no one simple quick way to get rid of codling moth. You have to do a range of things at different times of the year. So today, I'm going to show you how you can get rid of codling moth at every stage of their life cycle. Because the seasons are so different across Australia and the moth's life cycle is dependent on temperature changes, you need to understand your local climate for your efforts to be effective. The most active in spring and summer, from when flowers start blooming to the end of fruiting, and they can go through multiple generations during this time. Spring is the time when adult moths will emerge. So a simple thing you can do is to set some pheromone traps in your pear, quince or apple trees. Now, these traps will catch a few, but not enough to make a big dent. Their key purpose is to let you know when the adult moths are around, and that's the time to take some more action. Spring is also the season to lay a glue trap. Wrap the trunk with some masking tape, then paint on some super sticky horticultural glue to stop the adult moths climbing back up the tree to lay eggs. This trap needs to be replaced every two to three months during the whole active period. It's also best practice to use a physical barrier, like some simple mesh, when using a sticky trap. Otherwise, some birds or animals may get stuck too. Harder to see will be the tiny eggs that they lay on the surface of leaves and in fruit. They're the size of a pinhead. The eggs are laid on leaves after dusk once nighttime temperatures reach 15 degrees or higher in your area. The best way to get rid of them is to enlist the help of other insects, specifically Trichogramma, which is a small parasitic wasp that cleverly lays its eggs inside the codling moth's eggs, which kills them. You'll encourage these wasps into your garden if you don't use pesticides and include flowers with lots of nectar for adult wasps to feed on. Strategic plants that attract beneficial insects that eat codling moth are clover, carrot flowers and fennel. This is the time of year when the eggs that make it past the wasps will turn into little caterpillars that burrow into fruit and stay there quietly feasting for three to five weeks. To give them less fruit to eat, keep on top of your harvest. Pick healthy fruit as soon as it's ripe and try not to leave any fallen fruit on the ground. If you do find any with holes or caterpillar poo, get rid of them straight away. You can feed them to your chickens or bag and bin them as larvae can survive the compost. In autumn, the larvae that you missed will by now have grown fat. They'll wriggle down the trunk of the tree in search of somewhere to build their cocoon. 
they're likely to choose a crevice on the tree, under loose bark or in the ground directly near the base of the trunk. I wrap cardboard around the trunk of the tree to tempt them in. Every few weeks I check for cocoons and larvae and get rid of them. I do this from the first moth sighting all the way to winter. Now, here's one that's been on there for quite a lot longer. I'm going to open up and see what's happening. The cardboard has done its job. I'm now going to dispose of these guys quickly and safely. Because of this slope, I don't bring my chickens in here. But if you have chooks, they can also really help with this. They'll scratch around looking for and eating most of the ones that you miss. While the moths are dormant over the winter months, it's the perfect time to prepare for the spring onslaught. And sheet mulching works a treat. Laying sheets of cardboard topped with mulch below your trees will stop the emerging adults getting up through the soil to mate, lay their eggs and restart their life cycle. At a bonus, it will suppress weeds as well. All these things are pretty quick and easy to do and after a while can become a normal part of your backyard orchard care. You'll soon find the effort well worth the delicious and unspoiled rewards. Now, if you have some neighbours with some apple, pear or quince trees, you might want to share this video with them so that together you can work towards making your neighbourhood a codling moth free zone. What's your favourite rosemary? Well, I love Rosemary Blue Lagoon. It's a semi-prostrate plant that can get several metres across and it has these beautiful dark blue flowers and the bees love it too. If you haven't got space for a big sprawling plant, there's a more compact form called Mozart. It only gets about a metre across and looks fantastic trailing down a bank or even a retaining wall. Now, my least favourite rosemary is one called Tuscan Blue. It has lovely dark blue flowers and an upright habit. However, I find patches of it die off for no reason at all, so it can't be relied upon as a hedge. Can potting mix go off? Indeed it can. It already contains semi-decomposed organic matter, which will continue to break down. If the potting mix has been stored warm, then it's a possibility that the prills of slow-release fertiliser will have dumped all their nutrients so it can be quite rich. Plus, no matter how fresh or old the mix is, there's always a risk of Legionella bacteria. So open the bags outdoors and if you're concerned, wear a dust mask and gloves when you handle it. After about 12 months, all potting mix should be diluted with fresh potting mix. And if you do that at a rate of one to one, then you won't notice the difference. Here's one of the strangest plants you'd ever see. It's called a Chilean giant rhubarb. In Chile, what they do is they strip the stems and it becomes a really crunchy thing, sort of like apple or celery. But why you grow it is because these leaves they are amazing. The texture of them is just like sandpaper, very rough, and they look like a hand. The beauty of the leaves is that they grow a metre to a metre and a half wide and about two metres high, so these stems get really big. That's the flowering structure, and they are just amazing. This giant rhubarb has to live in water, has its roots way down into that water there, and that's because they just suck it all up and grow ginormous. You don't see these plants in Australian gardens very much, but overseas, especially in European gardens and English gardens, they're treated like a real ornamental. It is the most amazing plant, the giant Chilean rhubarb. Whatever type of garden you have, whether it's a courtyard, acreage or a suburban block, if you're starting from scratch or updating, it's important to pause and plan. This three-year-old garden in Sydney's eastern suburbs has had a complete garden overhaul to make the most of the small, tricky slope block, home to a family of six and Lenny the dog. They've managed to fit in kids' play areas, quiet spots for relaxation, 
productive plants and lush plantings that look fantastic all year round. It's a great example of good planning by their landscape architect. And today I'm going to give you the tools so you can tackle your own site analysis. One of the first steps in designing a space is taking the time to observe your surrounds. Spend some quality time with your garden and really get to know the site. This helps you decide what to plant and where. Think about recreation and relaxation spaces and even somewhere to hang the washing. Observation is the key part of any garden designer's process, so it's worth taking your time. First up, draw up a basic outline of your site. Start with the things that aren't going to change, like your house, big trees or steps that you'll have to work around. This yard pretty much started from scratch, but there are a few trees, fences, the driveway, entry points from the road, and the house that stayed. If you want to be accurate, you can measure out the boundaries. Otherwise, you can just step them out to get a rough idea. One of the key factors in planning any garden design is knowing how the sun's arc works at your place. Don't forget the angle changes in different seasons. We all need sun and plants do too. But we also need a little bit of shade. And it's a big limiting factor when deciding where things go, such as garden beds or even seats. Here, the front garden faces south and is shaded by the house. Southern exposures are usually shadier and colder, but there's enough direct western and northern sun in pockets for a diverse mix of cottagey and native plants to thrive, including Westringer and Grevilleas. This back terrace gets bathed in northern sun from the morning till the afternoon, so it's perfect for an outdoor eating area. And the pool area gets plenty of sun with enough dappled shade from the surrounding trees and the strelitzias and large heliconias. Having access to northern sun really opens up your plant choices. And if you need some shade, you can always add a pergola with some climbing plants on it. Now, a sunny spot is ideal for growing veggies. And while there's not a lot of space left in this small backyard, this northwest facing corner has become a perfect place for growing some citrus, there's an avocado, and even this mango is thriving. Eventually, the plan is to grow some veggies further along these garden beds. In the meantime, this small raised garden bed is easily accessible from the back door, so you can quickly run out and grab a few herbs. The other factor to consider is the slope of the site. No piece of land is exactly flat, unless, of course, it's been concreted or paved to be that way. Across your site, there could be gentle undulations or, as is the case here, quite a steep slope. And that's where terracing with retaining walls works really well. And to soften these edges, something like this dichondra works perfectly. As the land changes, so too does water movement. Rainwater will often gather in low spots at the bottom of a slope, so you can actually create pockets of planting that won't only take up the water, but can also direct the water where you want it to go. If you want to keep your plants happy, then you need to understand your soil. Soil itself and its quality can vary from one part of your garden to another. It's best to do a number of soil tests across the site. That way you not only get to determine the pH, but you also get to understand the balance in the soil between the sand 
silt and clay. This will help you choose the right plants for the soil type that you have without having to go through a whole lot of adjustments of that soil. Alternatively, you can just use raised garden beds. Once you've considered those elements, it's time to think about how you want to use the space. The way you move through a garden has a big impact on how you use it and how you feel when you're in it. Note down the points in the spaces that you need access to. Think your electricity box, your water meter, and of course, regular access for your bins to come in and out. Some paths will need to be direct and as flat as possible so you can easily carry things to your door. While some offer more planting opportunities, like these pavers with native violets creating a green mat between them. Others allow you to be immersed in the space. The side of the house is often underutilised, but here the designer has added winding stepping stones to encourage kids and adults to take their time and enjoy the garden. Once you get a clearer idea of the limitations and opportunities across your site, it's time for the creative part. This is where you get to dream up all of the things you want and need in your garden and then take the time to juggle and tweak and find the right place for each of them. The family needed space for the kids and a space to be together and apart. Don't forget to think about privacy and views too. What do you want to see outside of each window? Do you need to block out the neighbours or roads? Draw these points down on your plan so you don't forget when it comes time for choosing plants, colours and exact placement. A site analysis can go into a lot of detail. And being thorough means that it gives you invaluable insights. And even if you just map out a few of the factors, it will help create a more harmonious space for you and your plants to enjoy. So get planning. often hear organic, inorganic as terms when we're referring to mulch. Now organic mulch is generally plant materials like sugarcane mulch, yuki mulch, pine bark, any other plant material that you want to use to cover your garden beds to help invigorate the soil, to retain moisture and absorb moisture around the plants in your garden. They will break down over time, they will add to the soil structure and they will release nutrients into the soil. You can even use them to bulk up soils. Now, inorganic mulch is generally a landscaping term. So things like blue metal, river stone or pebbles. Now, they will work as a weed suppressant, but over time, weeds will eventually make their way in. They, of course, won't break down. Well, they will if you're there long enough, but they do hold in moisture, but they do also create a lot of heat. It's very hard to keep a constant or at least balanced temperature of the soil using materials like this. One of the big problems, particularly with blue metal, is that it will heat up your garden bed. So the plants will have a lot of trouble during the summer months where they can get a lot hotter than they would normally. Now, different succulent beds use a lot of different stone as a really nice feature. These I like a lot in indoor plants. They are really good as a decorative feature. So what do I use? Well, that's completely up to you. A big collection of indoor plants brings joy to your home and makes you feel great. But what about your pets? Fur babies or feathered friends sometimes like to test the edges of what's edible. Lots of plants are totally fine and some plants can make them sick or even worse. There's a range of risk profiles to keep in mind. 
A little nibble of an African violet may not do any harm, but consuming a lot can lead to an upset tummy. Best to keep them out of reach. Other examples of low-risk plants include bromeliads, ripsalis, bird's nest fern, spider plants and cast iron plant. Then there's the next risk category, plants that are just not safe to have at home at all if you have pets. If your pet eats any amount, call the vet straight away. Plants at this level of risk include cycads, which contain dangerous neurotoxins, philodendrons and most plants in the Aracee family, which contain saps that can paralyse the mouth and throat if eaten, aloe vera, cyclamen, and even lilies, which might sneak into the house in a bunch of cut flowers, and are especially dangerous for cats. Different pets have different risks, and a pet can be allergic to plants just like we can. So if you have pets and love plants, consult your vet or the RSPCA website before hunting out your next potted pal. As gardeners, we know a flower can change your whole day for the better. But what about your outlook on life? Millie's found a story about the transformative potential in a bunch of flowers. It's early morning in inner city Melbourne. Hey girls, can we give us a hand? Beautiful flowers and foliage are being unloaded at this special florist, where the mission is to empower young women from refugee backgrounds. You know, while the main focus is flowers, it's really about, you know, the women that work here and equipping them with skills for floristry in the Australian workforce. Morning, Fit. Thanks for starting on the prep for us. Morning. So we've got a really big day today, everyone. Lots of beautiful flowers, some nice bright bunches. Oh, these look gorgeous. Yeah, the proteas look really good today. Yeah. So we'll get started on our prep. Good morning. Oh, oh wow. Morning. What a garden full. I'm, um, I'm eager to help. Yeah. Is there a spare pair of snips? Absolutely. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. What an incredible range of flowers. You've got so many different things here. Mm. I mean, it's like almost four seasons on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Whereabouts do the flowers come from? Every morning we get them fresh from the market up in Epping. We like to get the freshest flowers and we want to get a range of different colours and a combination of native flowers and we also want to get some soft pastel pretty things like the hydrangea and snapdragons. I'm pretty familiar with these. Mm -hmm. No idea what this is. Mm -hmm. Can someone show me? After we unload the flowers, we have to prepare them. So mm -hmm. this is what the strippers are for. Right. Yeah. Grab your rose, find like a little nice angle just grab it from there and you strip it. The leaves and the thorns with it as well. So right. Just get like a nice little cute fresh stem. It just helps the flowers um, drink the water a little bit easier. Brianna, you're the qualified florist here mm -hmm. and tasked with training everyone. How did you come across this gig? I'm lucky to be able to be in a position that kind of combines um, my two worlds. So I've been a florist for a really long time. I've also got a background in social work. So this place just seemed like the perfect in between. And how do you take someone from maybe not working at all in flowers or mm. plants mm -hmm. and, and get them to the point where they're able to, to do this every day? It starts with, you know, learning about the flowers, conditioning and prepping them, um, what their names are and things like that. And then we move on to bouquet making and arrangements and vase arrangements and everything. Tell me, what are you both making here? So we're making the posy jar. Posy jar? Yeah, so we use the shorter flowers or the foliage that we have left over. Okay. Do you want to show me? Yeah, of course. So I already started doing the base, so I can add the flowers now. You see this dirty... Maybe a little bit damaged by water. Yeah, so you can remove it like this. Now it's ready to go. And we're gonna cut it shorter and pop that right here, like this. And now we can add one, uh, more flowers. Is there a formula to how you do this? 
No, you just see uh, if they, uh, the colors match together and you kind of think about like a, a painting. When you finish it and you see what you did, you feel something nice. Six new trainees are taken on every six months. They're guaranteed paid work here until they find another job. I've been working here uh, for almost three weeks now. Oh, you're really new. Yes, yeah, these are like my first attempt to starting to make a bunch. So I'm starting with the posy jars and then when I am able to do this, I will start for the next level. And what do you like about it? Are you, you think it's something you want to keep doing? Yes, I definitely. I love the smell, I love the colours and everything. It just feels so natural to work around here. So we'll start making our bigger bunch of the day. What are these called again? Early cheer. Oh. And they have that really beautiful smell too. Oh, smell. I feel really lucky that I get to be able to share my knowledge and work with these women and help them build their confidence every day. Yeah. Beautiful. Do you like that? Yes. It's yes. Part of me. Yes, I am. <laughs> Morning. Morning. Hi. How's Hello. it going? Good. Great. Is it good? Did we get nice stuff at market? Jane Marks is the founder. It's a social enterprise, which means maximising profits isn't the main game. For about 70% of the young women in our program, they weren't born here. But all of them face various barriers to finding that crucial first job in Australia. And so we are really that, I suppose, warm, welcoming, supportive work environment where they can feel vulnerable to make mistakes and to also express their culture. Why flowers? It's a really beautiful way for them to gain the skills and the confidence that they need to uh, work in Australia. Thank you so much. Have a good I think that the work that we do with a young, focusing on young women in particular is really important. Meaningful work empowers women. It is crucial for women to achieve financial independence and autonomy. Hello. They're so pretty. <laughs> What's you this like? one? So this is the protea mm -hmm. and hydrangeas. They're gorgeous. Thank They're you so much. Love them. You too. Bye. 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 It's really incredible being able to watch young women come to us at the beginning and they might have limited English language skills and maybe not that confident. You know, we really do get to see them thrive here. So, yeah, I feel, I feel a great, you know, sense of pride about, about what we do. It, yeah, it really is life-changing. <laughs> Still to come on Gardening Australia, Jane's making some cuts and a subtropical plants in her sights. Sophie digs into some living history growing in the garden. And we meet a gardener on a mission to spread self-sufficiency. The plant world never ceases to amaze me. Everywhere you look, there's different strategies and mechanisms that plants have developed to survive and thrive. Josh has unearthed a fascinating native plant in WA that you definitely haven't seen before. One of the great things about living in Perth is having the hills at our doorstep. I'll often come up here for bushwalks, not only for the change of landscape, but also to see the incredible flora. There aren't many waking moments when Ryan Craig is not thinking about plants. If he's not photographing them, he's illustrating them. And when he's not capturing an image with either a lens or a brush, He's studying them. He's a botanist with a very specific focus. He's completing a PhD on botanical parasitology. What are you actually examining as a botanical parasitologist? I am looking at uh, parasitic plants that feed off other plants for their nutrients and water that they collect from the soil. So the idea of one plant living on or even in another as a parasite would be very strange to some people. Oh, it is, it is quite strange. For the most part, most plants don't feed off other plants. 
But there's 4,500 plants around the world that do this. So this is the plant that I am studying for my PhD, Pilostylis hamiltoniorum, and it's on its host, Divisia angulata. They are very host specific. So we've got 134 Divisias here in West Australia, but only 10 of them play host to Pilostylis. So you're talking about those tiny buds on the stem, that's the plant? Yep, it's just these flowers that you can, you can see, but inside their stem, they're growing almost like a fungus. So they're growing entwined inside that stem. And when they come to flower, all you see is these buds just bursting out of their stem. What is it that your PhD is really delving into? Well, I'm really fascinated by the interaction that's at hand here. So how the parasitic plant is interacting with its host and how the host is interacting with the parasite itself. So the parasitic plant has no leaves. Yep, no leaves. It's not photosynthesizing them. It's not, it has no chloroplasts whatsoever. It has no external stem or roots. No, nope. My mind's just blown. I know, it, it is one of the most wild plants you could ever think of. And we've got them growing all the way through here in the Jarrah forests. So how much do we know about its life cycle? At the moment, they're flowering. As they're growing in their host, all these nice bright green growths you see here, the plant itself is actually growing probably about five centimetres behind the, the growth point of these stems, and it's growing inside. So we know even how far they are growing behind that new growth. And we know that when they come to flowering, they only flower on the second year's growth. What do they look like when they fully open? They look like a, just like a regular little flower. They've got the little central, um, this little central disc and they've got little petals around. What is the plant most closely related to? Funny you should mention, it's a plant that you might not think of to be related to a plant like this. It's the closest relative of the cucumbers and the pumpkins. Get out of here. Really? Yeah. How does it actually reproduce? So when these plants flower, they will be attracting many, many native bees. They're probably the only flowers that these bees have as a resource for nectar during a period of time when there's not much else in flower. And then once pollination's occurred, it produces these little purple berries. But there's a mystery there. We don't actually know what distributes their fruit. So you've explained pollination and they develop fruit with presumably seeds. Yep. How does germination work? Well, that's one thing we don't know either. When they produce their fruit, their fruit can contain anywhere up to a hundred tiny, tiny little seeds. And there's been many attempts to germinate these plants, but no one really knows how they germinate. Are they doing the host plant any damage? They, they are doing quite a considerable amount of damage to their host because what they are doing is they are pretty much forcing themselves through the gaps in between all of their cells and they're just breaking everything and they're bursting out of that stem. Sounds like a bad sci-fi movie. Oh, it, it pretty much is. They're, I like to call them the stem bursters because they just burst out of that stem. And so that's kind of brought up a question to me is why is some of these hosts looking quite healthy whereas some hosts seem to be struggling with the parasite? As you can see here, this plant looks from a distance like quite a generally healthy plant. But then you might go over there and you might find another one parasitized that's looking really disheveled. How many different individual plants could be within the host? That's actually quite unknown. We don't know whether it's just one individual or if it's multiple individuals. Um, and that's something for genetic work to be able to detangle because we visually we can't I see you them. Don't know. Yeah, it's just more more unknowns. There is multiple research projects within this. Yeah, so there's a lifetime worth of research that could go into this plant. The more I learn about plants, the more I realise just how little we actually know about them, especially the connections between them as part of broader ecosystems, which is why the kind of research that Ryan's doing is so critically important. So next time you're out for a walk in your local bushland, stop to think about all of those amazing things that are happening right underneath our noses. And if you're anything like me, it will absolutely blow your mind. It's nice to be able to grow something from the tropics here in Melbourne. And my token gesture is this. It's called Galangal. It's a wonderful plant that grows these gorgeous leaves 
and it's every now and again I have to take it out of this pot and divide it, just split it into bits and then repot it or give it away. And it's because it gets just too clumpy. And so it's a good idea to do that once every two or three years. Here, have a look at that. You can see the new shoots that are ready to come up and provide new growth. And so what you do is just get a knife or your secateurs and just cut through. And that's good. And then just pull it apart just gently. There's a lovely piece that you're left with. And that would be a perfect thing to put in the garden or in a pot. And as you're doing this, you get this beautiful fragrance from the leaves. As you crush it, it's got that lovely gingery, sort of spicy fragrance. Well, that's pretty easy, isn't it? From one plant, I've got three. Wonderful. Gardens aren't just collections of plants. They're collections of stories. You might have a plant that reminds you of a loved one. For me, it's my grandparents and their Cymbidium orchids. Or it could remind you of a significant event. Or it could simply remind you of home. Sophie's found a garden in the Adelaide Hills whose gardener is all about the story behind the plant and the history that comes with it. Sally Ann's property, which sits on two and a half thousand square metres at Nairn in the Adelaide Hills. Sally Ann believes that if you understand the history and folklore around plants, it adds an extra dimension to your enjoyment of them, and everyone benefits from a deeper enjoyment of their gardens. Sally Ann and husband Ian are both horticulturalists and they share the workload in this lovely garden where they were married 15 years ago. We met on a farm which is just uh, five minutes down the road from here. It was actually a brassica farm and Ian was the first person that I saw when I walked through the door. What are Ian's skills in the garden? Ian is a qualified horticulturalist like myself. He's very skilled with pruning. You'll see by the garden he's fantastic at topiaries, has a fantastic eye for lines and has a lot of input into what we plant. And what are your skills in the garden? I wouldn't say um, I'm an obsessive designer. I really like a natural flow in the garden, um, but I certainly really love um, the intricacies of plants, you know, the forms, the habits, you know, the colours. I'm a little bit colour obsessed. So what's the climate like here? Well, it's really quite harsh, Sophie. You know, it's a real Mediterranean climate, so very hot in summer, very cold in winter. We also get frost. And we're on heavy clay soil, mm. so that is really challenging, as everyone knows, but clay is great for holding nutrients and water, but it is challenging because of the cut of the block. So we really rely on super tough plants, you know, like your leucodendrons, adenanthus, your woolly bushes, Strelitzias and salvias. Salvias are a real blessing to this property. The garden is not only a place of beauty for Sally Ann, she's also fascinated with plant lore, or the history and stories that have grown alongside plants, and she loves to teach others about her findings. I just love sharing the experiences that I've had in horticulture, you know, the learnings. And, you know, when people become fascinated in something, that's when they really learn. So bay is just such a beautiful, beautiful, tough plant to have in your garden. So fragrant, fantastic for your stews and soups, but it's got beautiful, rich folklore or plant lore surrounding it. So if you delve a little bit deeper into Greek mythology, they wove crowns made of laurel for victory in poetry, athletics, so many other academic pursuits, and it's still used today. 
And look at this amazing cactus here in full bloom. Isn't it absolutely beautiful? So this is an Echinopsis. It's one of my favourite cactus in our garden. So Echinos derives from Greek meaning sea urchin or hedgehog. Okay. So think, you know, spiky as you can see, think echinacea, think echidna. But Absolutely. stunning, um, obviously doesn't like the frost being a cactus, so hence we keep it under shelter, but magnificent, fragrant flowers, so beautiful. Now this hibiscus syriacus is looking stunning. Now because of your frost you couldn't grow the tropical ones, but that's deciduous and it takes the cold. It's truly beautiful, Sophie, and there's so many different varieties that I'll have to explore. But, you know, as you said, being deciduous, fantastic here for the frosty conditions. And it's actually the national flower of Korea called the Korean rose, and plant symbology is abundance, family and protection. And speaking of protection, I see you've got your garlic. So garlic has a really rich, amazing history as well. It's revered throughout the world through different cultures as being a cure-all. Um, but amazingly enough, the Egyptian pharaohs used to pay their workers' wages, the majority in garlic, because it was believed to boost their strength, their immunity. Amazing. How incredible. The plant that formed a legend is the pansy, or viola species, which here Sally Ann has dotted around her veggie garden, along with other edible flowers. I really love this area. So pansies are so sweet. There's a really beautiful legend or mythology surrounding pansies that Cupid accidentally misfired an arrow and hit a pansy, which caused it to smile. And they certainly do add beautiful cheer to your garden. And pansy originates from the French word pensy, which means to think. Wow. The herb valerian, known for its sweet scent and calming properties, also has a place in plant law. The Pied Piper, it's believed, carried valerian in his pockets, not only to attract rats, but also to attract the cats, to help drive the rats away from Hamelin. How interesting. What other history does it have? In World War I, they actually used valerian tea or in roots um, to help soldiers with shell shock. Wow. And interestingly, an ancient herbalist once called valerian few, and I think if you have a little bit of a smell of my valerian herbal tea, you may know why. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> And right here, of course, we've got the sage, Salvia officinalis, or the culinary sage. This has got a long history of folklore, doesn't it? It does. So salvia comes from the Latin word to save or to heal. And if you are ever called a sage, it means that you are an esteemed and wise philosopher. Interestingly enough, sage was used in a medieval concoction called the Four Thieves Vinegar, which was meant to ward off the plague. But my very favourite is that it is believed that sage thrives in a garden led by a woman. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I'm going to go and check the health of my plant when I get home. <laughs> It can be fun to learn from the past, but it can also remind us what do plants mean to us now and what do plants mean to us into the future? By delving a little bit deeper, looking into the rich history of plants, what a beautiful way to connect with nature. All right, so we have a reputation. We are plant lovers. But is there a plant you hate? Well, hate is a very strong word, <laughs> Millie. But <laughs> I have strong negative feelings towards twitch grass. Twitch grass. <laughs> it just gets in my veggie bed and it goes down deep. And it's a hard thing to get out properly. If you leave one scrap behind, it'll flourish into a new plant. Okay. It's true. It doesn't have to be a weed, though. What are you... What are you... Well, it's, it, for me, it's a bit of a love-hate. Okay. I hate stinging nettles. When they hide into other plants, you put your hand into a bed to weed and suddenly you get stung. That's what I hate. But if you get them at the right time, they make a really nice soup. Mm. It's true, good with fish. <laughs> and they are 
really important plant, food plants for lots of butterfly larvae as Absolutely. well. So they all have a yeah. job. All right, I feel like I'm going a bit rogue here because I actually do have a plant I hate. <laughs> I hate lemon balm. I hate it. It's invasive. It tops up, pops up everywhere and it stinks. Ooh. Cannot stand it. Cannot stand the smell. Cannot stand how vigorous it is. Like it's just such an invasive plant. And like I've literally pulled it out of people's gardens when I arrive. It's like, well, that's got to go and then we'll start the consult. All right, know? I'll hide my lemon balm from you when you visit yeah. next time. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever dreamt about making a big change? Getting away from it all, growing your own food, getting a little closer to that idea of self-sufficiency? Well, our next story follows the path of a retired soldier who's done just that and found a global audience along the way. Looking guy. G'day, I'm Mark Valencia, retired soldier, founder of Self Sufficient Me, the YouTube channel and also website. I'm into sustainability, self sufficiency, upcycling, recycling, anything to do with nature. Let's get into it. Well, I'm a gardener from Belmere. Belmere is near Caboolture. It's about an hour's drive from Brisbane. Nina and my wife, we moved out here in 2006. The whole premise of it was to one day uh, leave the military and live a quieter life. We both had very busy jobs. So we've been talking about how this is affecting us and affecting more our children. So we would get up at dark, drop the children off at childcare, and then pick them up at dark, and it wasn't much of a life at all. I looked at Nina, I said, one of us is gonna have to stay at home. And she looked at me and she went, it's not gonna be me. And I went, oh, all right, well, I'll give it a go. And she said, righto. So I put my discharge in and decided to make a fist of it here. It wasn't easy. We went on the one wage thing and we robbed Peter to pay Paul. For a good five or six years, it was really tough. And we knew that one of our biggest bills was the groceries. So I just went to work trying to grow as much produce as I could in the backyard to cover the costs of, of living, really. Even though we had stuff or money, ironically, we were still happier. We've got three acres. When we first got here, there was just this big vacant lot in the middle with one stump. Down the last acre was just scrub. And we cleaned all that up. We got the chickens settled down there. And in the meantime, we started putting in garden beds and putting in fruit trees. Now that we've got all these mature fruit trees and a veggie garden, and I've learnt all this horticultural stuff on how to grow, it comes easy to me now. When I was in the military, we were required to jump out of a perfectly good aircraft. And as I went to jump out, the guy in front of me balked at the door, and I almost fell over the top of him, but then he went. But as I fell, the static line wrapped around my wrist, and there's this burn mark here. I got sucked out of the plane at that point, and my arm was, was connected basically to the aircraft and it smashed me back and I think I hit the side of the door or the side of the plane and it basically spiral fractured my forearm, both those bones. That was only the start because the actual breaking of the arm freed me from the plane and then I was out in the air trying to get to the ground. I ended up hitting the landing strip which is probably the hardest part you could ever pick out. So I did a lot of damage, but luckily I did survive. I almost did lose the arm a couple of times. It was a real turning point. Nina and I both suffered from PTSD on account of our military service. Good morning, ladies. 
The near-death experience really does make you appreciate every day. And I like to try to stop every day and think, be in the moment. This is the moment, live it now. It could be just walking through the garden, looking at a bee. It's amazing. I, I don't know, I'd probably put it at number one, the mental health aspects of a garden. And it doesn't have to be a food garden, but for me, food gardening gives me even more it's just that satisfaction of having to go grow something and then harvest it and then you're eating it. It helps me more with my mental health than anything. People would come over for a barbie and they would ask, how did you make this preserve? How did you grow this? And so I'd be telling this same story over and over. And one day after everyone had gone, Nina sat me down and she said, look, Mark, I love your stories, but honey, they are really driving me crazy. I'm hearing the same thing over and over. Do me a favour, get a website, use your computer, and then just direct people to it, and then you don't have to go through this long thing of explaining it. I went, yeah, that's a great idea. And then I thought, well, there's this thing called YouTube. Perhaps I could also make a YouTube channel at the same time and do tomato. some instructional videos. Yeah, I've got these tomatoes here. You can hopefully see along this furrow, got about 15 tomato plants. My first, I'd say, 100 videos were just awful. Thanks for watching, bye for now. I almost gave up because I wasn't getting much traction. I was too rigid and awkward, too much of an army instructor and not just myself. It wasn't paying any bills. I had this lemon tree, I loved this tree, and uh, I just stood in front of it, I had the camera, and uh, I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna tell people how it is. I just was myself. Tip number one, position. This is one of the most important things you can do when you're sighting and planting a lemon tree. And then about three months later, my phone just went crazy. And I looked at it and there was all these messages saying, congratulations, you got your first thousand likes on a video. And then went ding, ding, congratulations, an hour later was your first 10,000 likes on the video, congratulations. And before I knew it, I had 100,000 subscribers. And that's where my YouTube career just took off. G'day, I'm Mark from Self Sufficient Me, and I love to bury things in the garden. From then on, um, yeah, I've just been overwhelmed with the support that I've got to uh, now the channel I think is, is over 2.2 million subscribers. And on Facebook, 1.2 million subscribers. So yeah, over 3 million all up. You gotta pinch yourself. And I still find it surreal and I will never ever take it for granted. I realized I'm onto something bigger than just cost savings here. The mental health benefits and the physical benefits of getting out, getting into it, getting into the garden, really do help people, especially if you have a few troubles, which most of us do in life. Gardening, even if it's a balcony garden, can help a lot. Let's get into it. You know what they say, plant today, Harvest tomorrow. Your list of jobs for the weekend are here to help you do just that, aren't they? Yeah, I agree. In cool temperate gardens, the most loved of leafy greens, lettuce, can go in now. To improve germination in warm weather, pop the seeds in the fridge for a couple of days before sowing. It may look delicate with its feathery foliage and edible, vibrant blue flowers, but Nigella damascena is tough and dead easy to grow. Plant this annual in clumps, protected from hot sun. Catoniaster is a weed in bushland in much of Australia, so give it the flick from your garden and replace it with broadleaf hopbush, Dodonia viscosa, a butte butterfly-attracting native shrub. 
Warm temperate gardeners prep your patch for winter crops. Refresh hungry soil with manure, compost and mulch, remembering to leave a bed unfed for root crops like carrots and garlic. Love them or hate them, Agapanthus have finished flowering and should be deadheaded now. Aggies can spread readily by seed, so a deadhead will stop the seed spread. As summer flowers start dying and drying, have a crack at seed saving. Cut off flower heads and store until seeds are dry. The loose seeds can then be stored in a paper bag for sowing next year. In subtropical gardens, fill gaps in your patch before summer crops give way to winter. Kailan, radish, tatsoi and lettuce can be sown now and will be ready to harvest in a few weeks. Planning on planting peas, beans or sweet peas in autumn? It's time to test your soil pH. If your soils are acidic, apply dolomite lime to allow it to take effect before the seeds are sown. Compact, colourful and unkillable, bung in a Brachyscone breaker day. With pretty purple daisy flowers year round, this native ground cover is a great living mulch in a rockery or cottage garden. In the tropics, it's time to thin out banana suckers to promote full-on fruit. Leave just three healthy suckers, a leader and two followers, cut the remainder off at ground level and compost. Hot, humid weather promotes all sorts of growth, including build-up of algae in ponds and water features. Clean ponds regularly, remembering algae and pond scum makes great compost. Got a taste for tropical colour? Instead of buying plants, propagate your own. Take 15 centimetre tip cuttings from hibiscus, crotons and musaenda, pop into water and plant out once roots appear. You'd be tropo not to try it. Arid gardeners give fruit trees a good feed this weekend, especially hungry citrus, figs and pomegranates. Manure, compost, pelletised fertilisers or a combination of all three is perfect. Keep an eye on grapevines, fuchsias and hibertias, which can be defoliated overnight by the grapevine moth caterpillar. Pick these colourful caterpillars off as you see them and feed to the birds. Don't let all your hard work go to waste. Make time to harvest. Grab a basket and some snips and wander the garden each evening, having a look, a taste and picking your perfect produce. Have a cracking weekend, gardeners, wherever you are. And remember to head over to our Facebook and Instagram pages and get involved with the GA family. That's it. All done for another week. But don't worry, we're already sowing the seeds for next time. Here's what's in store. How safe is your soil? Well, I'm meeting some scientists who are running a program to map soil contamination, and I'm going to learn what gardeners need to do about it. In the veggie patch, the tail end of the summer crops means it's time to transition to the autumn crops. I'll be getting an early start to make sure my patch remains productive. And we meet someone who's found her happy place among a jungle of indoor plants.